Today, I'm going to just give you a brief idea about refraction and how do I approach pediatric refraction. So there's very rarely a case that comes across my clinic over the many years that I do not have to refract. Even if somebody comes with a condition which I do not expect a refractive error, since a lot of conditions require you to dilate the pupil, and once you get good at refraction, it is, doesn't take very long. So I think it's extremely important to know how to refract and when to refract. But the most important thing in pediatric ophthalmology for refraction for the large majority of children is at when to prescribe and what to prescribe. There are very definite guidelines laid down for prescription uh, and a lot of research, very good research has been carried out in uh, the growth of the infant eye as far as refraction is concerned. So there's no excuse for us as pediatric also not to know that evidence and be aware of this hard evidence that says when we should prescribe, when not to prescribe, and what should we prescribe. Those are the three very important questions. And the best way you can guide yourself uh, is to know what is the uh, rate, the course of emetropization. So though I have a lot of things that I can talk about in refraction, I'm going to basically talk about emetropization. So first of all, just to let you know, this is a state of vision where an object at infinity is in sharp focus within the eye lens in a natural relaxed state. As you can see, this source is the commonly consulted source of wisdom called Wikipedia, and it is not correct because I would like to correct this first, and this is something that is a common misconception. A state of vision where an object at infinity is in sharp focus when the clear, well-defined, focused image falls on the retina. And that is something that everybody should remember, that if you are going to refract and if you're going to prescribe, how sure, how sure are you that this image is going to be a well-defined, clear, well-defined and focused image on the retina. And why is that? Not because that we want to create this image on the retina, because we have to start thinking about the next step, which quite a lot of ophthalmologists and opticians and myself included never thought about, is that that image is meant to be served to the brain for visual processing. And the brain does not like blurred images, especially if they're coming from one eye and the other eye is sending a well-defined focus image. So as ophthalmologists, opticians, orthoptists, you must start thinking about not just the retina, but the brain and where the visual processing is going to occur. So a knowledge of the primary visual cortex, its uh, pathway from the right and left eyes, the mixing of the two pathways, the columnar organization, the messages from the primary visual cortex of these well-defined focus images going to the secondary associated visual areas, and then finally to deliver all the visually guided behaviors that you carry out for most of the day. So the, that is where refraction lies. The refraction lies in the primary first principle of pediatric ophthalmology. In a developing visual system, which is very sensitive to insult, well-defined focus images are appreciated by your visual cortex and all its associated visual areas. And because it is a developing system, blurred, unfocused images are going to make, have a serious effect on that development. And this starts at birth with the process of emetropization. So what are the summary of changes that can occur in emetropization? So this emetropization process eventually leads to changes in refraction. Because we're going to talk about refraction today. There are many changes that occur with emetropization. We won't go into those today. So when you are born, all of us know that the large proportion of children, the majority of babies who are born are born hyperopic. It does, that is not a cultural difference. However, the level of hyperopia may be different in different geographical regions, but there is largely a hyperopia or hypermetropia. If you have low hypermetropia, the emetropization process will be linear. That means you can follow it 
every few months and you will see a linear change. However, it is now known that if you have high hypermobility at birth, which means greater than 45 diopters, which is outside of the normal curve or the normal distribution, then it is not linear. You should expect a very fast change in this high hyperopia and a slower gradual change afterwards if there is going to be normal hematropization. Why is this important? Because then you can follow the child up in a proper way. So if supposing you have three diopters of hyperopia, four diopters of hyperopia, you might say, well, I'll see you in six months or nine months. And I expect it to change in a linear fashion. However, if you have high, high hyperopia, you want to see them quickly because the rate of change will be quicker to in, ensure that this child is heading towards uh, reasonable emetropization, you might follow them earlier. So no change for very high hypermetropia or when plano. So if you have a hyperopia of seven, eight, nine diopters at birth, then it is unlikely that this will change. So that's another indicator for you of how to follow a child up. When they are plano, which is very unusual, then you are thinking of myopia. And this change in hyperopia is not due to corneal or lenticular power because that has almost achieved normal growth by the time the infant is born. A large proportion of this change occurs due to a change in the vitreous chamber depth. There's a little bit of flattening of the cornea, there's a little bit of change in the lens power, but very little. Uh, and most of the change occurs in axial length. And that axial length is increase in axial length is reflected in the increase in the vitreous chamber depth. So therefore, I just want to emphasize the point that the initial refractive error is the most influential. So let's get on some graphs. So these graphs are figures that I have taken from uh, scientific publications, some of them are acknowledged, some of them are not, don't worry about that. But they are based on the only graph that I've taken are of large population studies. And these three or four graphs that I'm going to show you now, if you can commit them to memory and always me look at, see them in your image, in your brain, when you're seeing a child and have done a refraction and try and fit that child or the infant into this range. So, Let's say at three months of age, difficult age, you can refract a child, you can know what the refractive error is, you don't need an accurate one, you just need to know how much hyperopia there is. So this is a large proportion of children who have refractive error at three months of age, they've been done by cycloplegic retinoscopy, and you can see that the normal distribution or the inverted bell-shaped curve is skewed to the left, that means towards hyperopia. But if you were to see the median or the mean here, you can see the error ranges from plus one to plus three. Plus five and above is rare. Minus one and minus two is rare. So immediately you know whether you're dealing with an infant at three to four months of age in this region, this region, or this region. And that makes up your mind as to whether you think this is normal, not normal, etc. I must add a note of caution here. The add a note of caution is that if you find that the child is straight-eyed, there are no visual concerns, and you are doing a refraction to see whether this child needs eyeglasses or not, and if you find plus four at three months of age, you are not going to prescribe the glasses. You're going to watch them. However, if within this range, heading towards this side, towards the right, of this graph, if this child has visual behavior that is not good, or very importantly, has a strabismus, or if this child has a difference of more than one and a half diopter, one and a half or more diopters between the two eyes, then you're looking at something abnormal. You may not wish to prescribe glass at that time, time, but you want to see them in about two or three months to see whether the refractive error is emetropizing or not. So that's why this graph is quite important at three months of age. So let's move on to a bigger graph. Okay, 
So here is the cycloplegic spherical equivalent refractive error at three months. So this is cycloplegic retinoscopy, and this is the resultant refraction. The probability of emetropization is on the vertical axis, and the spherical SER is on the horizontal axis, and these are in diopters. So the probability of reaching two diopters by 18 months of age as a function of the level of cycloplegic spherical equivalent at three months of age from the previous graph, okay? So you see a baby at three months of age and you see what are the chances that they're likely to reach two diopters by 18 months of age, which would cons be considered as probably not prescribable unless you had an isometropia or strabismus. So this is a high probability on the top of the graph. This is a low probability. So you can see if you have five to seven diopters, then there is a less probability of emetropization compared to two to four diopters. This is the second graph that you should think about if you are trying to predict what this three month old is going to do. Another thing that I find that is uh, quite worrying to people and they, and they go in one camp or the other, that means what about astigmatism? What about the cylindrical correction? How do we know in a baby or a young child who hasn't got dosis, hasn't got a corneal problem, has got astigmatism? Is this going to disappear? Is this not going to disappear? Is it going to emetropize? So very helpfully, here is another graph that you might remember. So this is the expected astigmatism in infancy to start off with where the greed square. This is pooled data from two or three different studies. And this is the age in months on the x-axis and the cylinder power on the vertical axis. So if I take this pool data and go to these month uh, groups, you can see that the expected astigmatism in infancy will decrease rapidly for the first year to almost no astigmatism and then stay stable. So this gives you an idea that if you had two and a half diopters of astigmatism in a three month old, it will rapidly disappear by nine months of age. And it should keep rapidly disappearing. So you can see this is not linear. This is a rapid disappearance and then a slower disappearance over a period of time. So again, this is important to remember. If you have three diopters of astigmatism, then the curve is slower. But if you have three diopters of astigmatism 11 months of age, you're not likely to get rid of that. Remember, the rules are different for strabismus and for anisometropia. How about anisometropia? So now you say, okay, how much anisometropia can I expect in an infant? What is normal? I was very surprised when I pulled the data with the help of many other people to look at expected anisometropia in infancy. You can see the green one at zero to two months, that is the expected anisometropia and it doesn't have a huge standard deviation. I haven't drawn the standard deviations here because they were not large, neither were they in cylinders, so they are missing. But you can see, just remember this graph, keep it simple, uncluttered, 0.75 diopters. So if you have two diopters of anisometropia, one and a half or more, then you are likely to be looking at difficulties. But if you do have within this range of 0.5 to one diopters of anisometropia, that again reduces rapidly and is almost disappeared to 0.25 by nine to 11 months of age. So any more anisometropia would be considered as not good and to be watched very carefully. So these are the three or four graphs that I'd like to begin with. If we have a chance to talk more about pediatric refraction, we can delve into these things and see how one factor relates to the other, how does astigmatism relate to hyperopia, anisometropia to all those things. So we can talk about those things, but this is like a general top shelf messages that I'm trying to give you. So here is a summary. What happens in hemotropization? The eyes lengthen, cornea and lens flatten slightly and lose power, and the lens thins with increase in refractive index. The eyes lengthen is the most important thing. 
there is a rapid process of emetropization. It is not linear as such, as far as the axial length is concerned. There's a very rapid increase in axial length for the first year or so, and then a slower increase, and then a further slower increase in axial length till about six, seven years of age. How does this axial length grow? This modulation of the axial length growth was the most significant correlation to uh, emetropization. So if you have a chance and you're measuring the axial length of an infant and you are not seeing it grow, then you know this, this eye is not emetropizing. How does it actually grow? It is a puzzle that nobody has been able to solve at the moment, but there are many suspicions as to how this happens. Is there actual active visual feedback in a baby's eye, in a neonate's eye, in an infant's eye as they look around the visual environment, that they are defocused and that defocus stimulates the emetropization through a feedback signal? Or is it that as they try and accommodate, and you know that infants and babies have got a large amount of accommodation, as they accommodate more and more, they have an ability to send a signal back to remove the defocus. There are things about accommodative lag, which are also theories, which I understand very little of, because I cannot get my head around how can they know about this accommodative lag in a neonate. However, there are theories and you can read them and we can go into it later on. So in summary, I want to give you a summary of the thing about uh, what, what we talked about. And then I'll give you a little bit about the theory of emetropization. Significant refractive errors based on those graphs, if you remember those graphs, beyond 12 months suggest failure of emetropization. 80% of children have completed their emetropization for refractive error by 12 months of age, not necessarily axial length, refractive error. Failure of emetropization is known as a significant risk factor for strabismus and amblyopia. So, the next slide I'm going to show you is uh, borrowed and uh, from a frontier technology frontier May 2011 issue where they created uh, models of emetropization. And the theory that I feel has got a lot of substance and maybe needs to be looked at more is that eye grows towards the location of the image. So an infant eye, when it is hyperopic, the image is behind the retina theoretically and virtually. So there is defocus here. This is defocused on the retina. And there is a stimulus for this defocus. The stimulus makes the axial length grow. And you can see this faint line here, and this is grown to the point of focus. Whereas if you have a myopic defocus, which means either your cornea is too steep or the lens is too strong, you get a focus point in the front or your eye is too so in the in the in an infant eye, you're not talking about a myopic long axial length here. You're talking about the rays coming to a focus well before the retina. And it is thought that in that point, the actual eye remains or becomes hyperopic. However, this part of the model doesn't work for everything, but this part, the first, the top part, does work for most of the cases of hyperopia. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have at this point before I move on to the next thing. I don't know whether anybody's modulating the questions or somebody's modulating the chat room. Oh. If there are any questions, please let me know. Because using... so we're going to move on to a different thing now. Is that the cause of myopia and the theory of myopic defocus? Sorry, could you just repeat that question? And thank you, uh, thank you for asking this question. Uh, the theories which are coming regarding uh, high prevalence of myopia in children because of using screens for a long time. Mm -hmm. Does myopic defocus theory work in those children? It, it certainly could. Uh, nobody knows yet because of uh, uh, you know excessive use of smartphones, especially small screens for near, with the excessive accommodation being exerted for prolonged sustained periods of time may be leading to this higher prevalence of myopia in young children. Though obviously that will not apply to infant emetropization. But I do agree 
that excessive accommodation could lead to some degree of defocus, which then may cause myopia. But we do know that there is a large number of children now coming with acute onset esotropia after prolonged use of near screens, especially smartphones. And the myopia is certainly increasing. But the myopia is also in there. If you're moving on to myopia in children, then I think there is a lot to be said about the study which said that outdoor light or UV light or the kind of sunlight and uh, outside light helps to decrease the prevalence of myopia or excessive accommodation. And that's why those kind of things have led to these treatments of low dose atropine and also spending two, three hours in daylight outside for children to reduce the... But the jury is out, sir. I don't think the answer we know yet. Uh, my question is, uh, the, you have mentioned about the linear correlation between the hypermetropia and emetropization. Yes. Uh, when uh, we do the cataract surgery and make the child baby FAK, and mm -hmm. the myopic shift, do, uh, is it the linear uh, correlation sustain or not in this case? No, no, not all, not at all. That's a very good question. Like the first one was a great question. No, unfortunately, once we have interfered in the eye, removed the lens iris, uh, ciliary body accommodation mechanism, then all bets are off. There is no so. That's another very good question because if you look at the previous, let's say, if I go back 10 years and let's go back 20 years before that, if you pull all the literature of axial length growth after pediatric cataract surgery, then the majority of children were left AFA cake. There was this kind of different kinds of surgery being done. You found that unilateral AFA were very often myopes, but bilateral AFA remained hyperopic. So if you were took your cataract out and we gave you plus 20 diopter or 18, 16 diopter of AFAK glasses, then somehow those children may have gone down to plus 12, plus 10, but le not less than that. Whereas if you were unilateral AFAK, then giving glasses caused, led to myopia. Now, there could be two reasons for it. One is that unilateral AFAK is very often associated with persistent primary hyperplastic vitreous. Uh, or persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous, PHPV, and that is associated with glaucoma. And in the infant eye with glaucoma, there is axial length growth due to the expansion from the high intraocular pressure. But also we know that if you take monkeys and you deprive them in one eye with the uh, opaque contact lens, they become myopic. And we do know that unilateral AFAK is associated with greater visual deprivation than bilateral AFAK because of the significant anisometropia and image size differences that are being caused even when you're wearing a contact lens in the AFAK eye, which was not often. So the, again, the jury's out, we don't know, but certainly the normal linear uh, emetropization is only for low hyperopia. If you have hyperopia in a normal infant of more than five diopters, then linear is not seen. You actually see a much more rapid emetropization in the first few months. It's like the eye is trying to lose and get back into normal distribution. So what I've talked about with those graphs is entirely about normal emetropization. But in strabismus, in anisometropia, in astigmatism, in infancy, beyond the norms, cataract, removal of cataract, we don't know. We have we have never studied them in detail to know what is the emetropization process in AFX in infancy. Yes, we have got some graphs. We have done some work on looking at, but that's full retrospective work. Prospective has not been done. So thank you for the questions. I'm just going to move on, if that's okay into some basics about, again, just a bird's eye view of cycloplegic retinoscopy, okay? So you can look up any pharmaceutical book or pharmacology book and look at all these dilating or cycloplegic agents and what do they do? They disable accommodation, they reveal all the hyperopia. 
They are considered the gold standard. They are essentially, in every case, of strabismus and isometropia, astigmatic, amblyopia, etc. People say that you should reduce the prescription by tonus amounts, which could be 0.5 diopters, could be one diopter if you have a high hyperope child. To, for some unknown reason to me, people reduce the prescription by two or three diopters, thinking that the child will not wear glasses. It has never been proved uh, that reducing for tonus or giving a reduced prescription is good for the kid. I think if you're going to spend your time, subject the child to dilating drops, do a careful refraction, and that's the value you've got. It's a highly uh, specific technique, refraction, in children uh, based on extremely good scientific principles. And if you do it well, you should get the true refractive error of that child under psychodegia. And my recommendation to you is rather than be controversial and reduce it to 0.5, 1, 2, 3, 4 diopters, you should just give the full prescription and try and explain to the parents that these eyeglasses are necessary and they should keep it on, though the child may not like them for the first few weeks. But that's my own personal opinion. If you do not know, then these are the kind of things that are from a pharmacology book. Obviously, for dark brown irises, atropine is useful. Now, this is the difficulty here. The maximum effect, according to many pharmaceutical studies, says atropine is effective within 60 to 180 minutes. But all the world over, unless it's recently somebody's changed their practice, where there are dark brown irises, we send them home uh, for a few days or a week and then call them back with atropine once a day. I wish somebody would do a study of this as to when is the maximum effect achieved by keeping this still in the clinic and hoping that this would uh, shorten the delay and shorten the expense of sending children home and bring them back in again. The rest of it is clear. I don't think I'm going to spend too much time on it, but if you don't have this, you should definitely know about these things. And basically, you're going to use atropine or cyclopentylate, the other and home atropine in some centers, but tropicamide is not really used for cyclopedic retinoscopy in my book. One of the, I just tell everybody, uh, these are the retinoscopy techniques that I apply, a tidy lens box with all the lenses placed correctly in the right slots. Never have a dirty box because you will definitely make mistakes and go up and down the scale without knowing. You should dim the lights in the room. This is about uh, twice the amount of light I would have in a room. Make sure that they have got a distance fixation target, especially if there's any latent accommodation left. And the important thing is that if you have a non-accommodative target in the distance, you ask them to look at that with your retinoscope in your hand, and you look at the speed and the quality of the reflex, and then ask them to look at your light or a toy that you're holding in that hand, and you will see if that quality and the, the quality and the speed of that reflex changes, that means they're not fully paralyzed or not fully cycloplegic. So you should think about it. You should get used to your correct distance. Many people think they're doing it at 50 centimeters, though at 66, and that people who are 66 are doing it at 50. So it's a good idea when you start off to make sure your correct distance for the first 50 diffractions, you measured it, and then it becomes almost a proprioceptive issue for yourself. Remain on axes. It depends on whether you can shut your each eye separately and then remain on axis of the eye that you're refracting. But it's important, especially for refractions in children, to leave their other eye looking at a distant target or a toy or something like that when they're cyclopleached so that they are not losing interest. I usually neutralize all with spheres and calculate the cylinder afterwards. I draw a retinoscopic cross. I write my sphericals. I calculate my prescription. I mention my working distance. But each of these things we can discuss a bit more later on. So here I am uh, trying to get started with the refraction. Both eyes are open. I am at my usual distance. And I usually hold my, can you see the strabismus in this girl? So you're not on axis. Is that okay? So in these cases, in these specific cases, you have to make sure that the other eye is occluded. This is, she is cyclic. So you will cover that eye like this. It's a simple matter of using your multi-axial wrist joint to rotate it and turn the lens the other way. And you have occluded the other eye, getting fixation from the strabismic eye, and you can do it on axes. So moving on from here, uh, and if a child is uh, doesn't like this, you can't do it, you can ask the older child to do this. Now I'm going to give you some 
basic principles without going into detail, but again, these are things that you can discuss in great detail. What are the prescribing rules in esotropia? As I said before, prescribe the full amount, ensure spectacles fit correctly, are centered correctly. When they come back, follow-up visit assessment for these aspects is critical. Many a child I've seen with the wrong eyeglasses having prescribed and never checked by the clinic when they came back with the glasses. I didn't catch that. Could you try again? I repeat the cycloplegic refraction uh, at regular intervals. And uh, okay, I found this on. Sorry about that. My city came on for some unknown reason. Okay, so repeat the cyclopedic refraction based on what you find in the first uh, uh, visit and also what the child has and the remembering the emetropization occurring. How about exotropia? If an exotrope is myopic, please prescribe the full myopic prescription. Please do not reduce it because it aids control of the intermittent exo. However, if an exotropic is hyperopic, usually they are older children. So therefore, you could do subjective and uh, refraction and find out what is the minimum hypermetropic correction after your cyclopedic retinoscopy, coming back again after the cyclopedia is worn off to see what you can do to achieve maximum visual acuity. Because giving the maximum hyperopia here is going to make the exotropia worse. Correctly fitting spectacles is very important. Again, centered correctly. Uh, now we move on to anisometropia, which is balancing emetropization with visual acuity development. That means it's important to remember that anisometropia graph always, always determine the full retinoscopy result. There is no question about reducing the uh, refractive error if it's in both eyes to match both eyes. If there's an isometropia, give the an isometropic prescription. Prescribe the full treatment in both eyes, or if you want to, which is not with my principles, reduce the treatment by the same amount in both eyes. If some people do, to get them back into some sort of an emetropization pattern, there is no evidence to suggest that works, but it is a way to deal with it. Okay, so there are other things I can talk to you about, but I am think that we are, I'm not sure because I was late. Uh, may I just ask Professor Asad as to how much more time do I have so that I can tailor my talk accordingly? So, Tinda, I think uh, one hour will be at around uh, 9.45, or you are 9.45. Okay, finish by 9.45. Yes, I will definitely finish by then. Thank you very much. I'm really, uh, thank you for your patience and also your attention. Thank you. I'll just carry on then. So here are some other tips that I can give you, which you, some, some of you might know already. Near retinoscopy. So it's an important thing to learn. It is used occasionally, but there are some very specific times when you should be able to do near retinoscopy. Here, what you're trying to do is to see what is the refractive error by using a technique which has been popularized by two or three different people, not retinoscopy, et cetera, and you can choose whichever one you like. But here, the cycloplegic agent is not used. Here, there is an absolute, ab my preference is to have an absolutely darkened room. I have a distance of 40, 50 centimeters, which is two diopters of refraction. Is that okay? So I know that a normal infant should be exerting two diopters of refraction if they've got a accommodative target in front of them. My light source is a retinoscope. The pupil is dilated due to darkness, not because of a cyclic agent. And I let the pupil reflex become stable over a period of time, sending the child into an almost dreamy state. I adjust the prescription by about 0.5 or minus to minus 0.25 diopter spherical, depending on age. Again, this is another complicated issue there, which I don't want to go into detail now, but near retina, I just want to bring this up here, that I use near retina with both the lenses at the same time and try and see if there's an anisometropia that is significant. Or sometimes I use an occluder 
lens in that eye at a normal lens or a spherical lens in this one, depending on how the child is doing and whether they have strabismus. I do find this technique useful, but very rarely would I ever prescribe from it, but it gives me an idea as to what kind of refractive error I might be dealing with. I still would depend on a cycloplegic retinoscopy. So there's another technique where you can look for dynamic retinoscopy, but here this is not for a refractive error. This is for measurement of accommodation. It's a very useful technique because some children have hypo accommodation. This is the only way at the moment that you can actually measure uh, for accommodative effort. And if there is hypo accommodation, you can help them uh, with appropriate spectacle corrections. But be careful that you don't make it a crutch and they lose their ability to accommodate. Again, you do this in ambient or dim illumination and you use a self-illuminated target. I'll show you some pictures of that fixation on the near target here again, just like in near retinoscopy. Retinoscope is at the same point as a target, and I'll explain to you why in a moment. You observe the movement of the uh, you observe the movement of the reflex as you move your retinoscope, and you check for the accommodation lag, which I'll again show you. There is a lens method that I use or move the retinoscope method, which is the NOT method, again popularized by NOT, and you expect a lag in normal young children, not infants, of about 0.75 diopter spherical. Let's see if I can show you to explain it better rather than going into the details. So here's a child with a Down syndrome in whom I expect hypo accommodation. As usual, their muscle tone is less. So here is uh, his uh, darkness, uh, the eyes illuminated. And now I've got the retinoscope in one hand and my lit up self-illuminated toy in the other hand. You can see now that he's looking at the toy, but he's also my retinoscope reflexes on his eye. And the next one is under uh, light conditions, so I can show you here. So that's the setup. So now what I tend to do here is to get him to look at the target, which is in line with my retinoscope at 50 centimeters. And then I move the target ahead to about half that distance and see whether he is accommodating by change in the retinoscopic reflex. So that would be my first point to see whether he is accommodating enough to keep that in focus. And then if I notice that he is or is not, then I will confirm that with the lenses. So that's the kind of tips I want to give you in refraction, but I think more importantly over the next 15 minutes, I'd like to talk you through some practical aspects of uh, refraction by showing you some real life examples. <coughs> so these will all be children. I think uh, somebody's got their mic on. I think it's uh, Mr. Muhammad Azar. Uh, if you don't mind switching off your or muting yourself, that'll be great. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to show you some examples uh, of refraction, uh, practical application through a series of videos. Uh, and these videos will cover various aspects of refraction. I don't want to spend too much time on this one. But let's look at the first one, okay? So here is a girl uh, of a young age sitting in my clinic and those of you who have done a lot of strabismus will realize that maybe maybe she has a left small left isotropia so we can probably confirm that by running the video so it's important to realize what i'm asking her to do the camera is a little bit distance away it's not at six meters about three or four meters and i've got an accommodative target there and a flashing light so I'm asking her, and this is very important when you're doing examination in strabismus, that you continuously talk to the child and tell them what to do so they are maintaining their attention. You will not get very far if they're not accommodating. The camera there, the bottom there. Okay, you can edit. Okay. And the second, sorry. And the second point that yeah, I'd like to bring to your attention. The second point I'd like to bring to your attention. The 
Ah, oh, it's stopping. Sorry. I'll have to tell you while it's playing. Is that okay? I want you to look at that occluder. Those of some of you who recognize the occluder very well, which I have tried to tell everybody about since uh, I discovered it some years ago, and it's called the Spielman occluder. If you get the Spielman occluder, which is not very expensive, you will find that you will learn a lot about strabismus by looking at what's happening behind the occluder in the occluded eye. And that will give you a very good idea about strabism. Right, the smallest set on that camera there now. Can you see the letters on the camera there? The bottom there? It looks well, looking at it. That's it. Well done. So she does have a left isotropia, yeah. but she has a fixation pattern where you switch his back for fixation to the right eye. So keep looking there. Now, can you look at this letter here? This is for Nair. Ignore that you can't see her eyes very well. She is now not looking, she's looking at a letter on the other side of the thing. It's a little reduced snellum chart. Unfortunately, her eyes are not in focus, but the target is. But you can see what I'm talking about. The left is a so the there. Now we right. have refracted her and she's wearing her eyeglasses. The whole point of pediatric refraction is to business is to see what the refraction is, decide what to prescribe, when to prescribe, how to prescribe, and then watch what the effect of the eyeglasses is. The examination of strabismus is as detailed, if not more, after you give eyeglasses. Is that okay? So this has been given for her vision and hopefully for the control of her strabismus. But let's see how much it controls her strabismus. This is a hyperopic prescription. Straight the camera there. Um, sorry, thank you for bearing up with me with my videos, which is causing a bit of a trouble. I'm the smallest left on the camera. Let's take it forward till the point she's wearing her eyeglasses. There. So she's got her eyeglasses on. Uh, the camera there, the red light. Now you will notice with the speed of the that she has no strabismus or a small folia, a very, very small folia. And this is looking in the distance, but we have to confirm that this so-called fully accommodative isotropia is fully accommodated for distance and for near. I have adjusted her eyeglasses because she was not. Now she's got the foria, but I've got to see whether the foria is aligned once I stop occluding her. And there, you can see the left eye moved out to fix, so that means the foria is controlled. Now I have to stop at her right eye and see if the right eye moves out to control. So it does. So now she's looking for near. Now, I have to make sure that she's aligned for near as well before I call it fully accommodative isotropia, which she is. So these are edited videos so that we don't spend too much time on them. But is it truly fully accommodative? The whole point of fully accommodative isotropia is perfect alignment and binocular function tests. So you're not fully accommodative isotropia unless you have sensory evidence to prove that you are fusing and you're seeing depth. And one of the things that you can do in a fully accommodative isotropia is this little test, which I highly recommend if you have somebody with eyeglasses and there is the four diopter. So this is the second one. So here uh, you will see that we are going to use the four diopter prism base out for distance and for near to see whether she's bifovially fixating, which means when I put the four diopter prism base out, in front of the left eye, she should see a certain eye movement and a recovery eye movement because the four diopter prism will displace her for via off the fixation target and then she has to refuse. So be careful when you see this. If you're done in the right eye, then the other eye, then it'll be done for near. Straight into the camera there. Find one little thing on there into the red light. Red light. So you see that movement and then she refuses. And you have to repeat it three, four times really and get it to most okay. of the time. Well done. So well. Again, right there. glasses have to be adjusted and centered. Sorry about the reflection, but you can see that she's fusing. Her eye goes in and she fuses and she comes back. You have to do it carefully. 
and see that she doesn't have a microtrophia where the eye goes out and doesn't refuse. And you would repeat the same exercise for me. Now look at the small metric here, which letter I didn't choose to look at. Now she has very little, if any, movement from the right eye, and then you will look at it from the left eye. Remember, for near the movements are smaller. Okay, so now the other thing that you need to do is to see whether this fully accommodative esotropia with the eyeglasses is fragile or strong. She's on the four diopter prism base out, she's bifurcally fusing. You can do fusion with Bagolini lenses of worth four dot, and then you can do any stereo test that you want. But what is important here is that as you fully correct this girl and make her fully accommodative with sensory tests, you want to see how strong this alignment is. And I'm sure some of you already thought of the test that I'm going to talk about. It's called the prism fusion range. It's very important that you know for prediction that she has got a good prism fusion range, at least horizontally, so that you know that she can maintain her alignment. If the prism fusion range is very low, then she's likely to break into strabismus again. Just look straight ahead at the camera and tell me if you see two of the cameras. I'm just going to show you the technique. Single? Now. This is for this thing. I'm asking whether she sees double of anything. He's saying signal. And then I check for myself by doing the cover test to see whether she's really fusing. Straight ahead. This is a base yeah, out prism being signal. lowered. Signal. And you move it in short steps, giving the child enough time to refuse. Very good. Some children like to please you and they can keep saying signal. This I'm reading as to what point she's getting to. But you have to keep checking the little cover test to see whether she's still alive. So you can see that she has got a very strong base out fusion range. And the same thing you will do with, uh, and you must check the point at which she breaks, and you must check the point at which she recovers. So the break point and recovery point in prism fusion range tells you a lot. If the two points are very close, they've got extremely good alignment and strength of alignment. If there's a break point and the recovery point is far away, then again, there is an incidence of fragility. It just looks strict. So here we have another one. Obviously, this girl has a large angle right to business. Right is the trope. Fixation pattern is good. She can fix from either eye without switching back to any other eye. So it's a good sign of alternation. So she has to blink to do that. So here she is, uh, refracted and wearing her eyeglasses. Again, eyeglasses not to be adjusted, they're not centered. No glasses on. Pretty straight. So she's pretty straight. She's got a slight vertical deviation, you can see. If you can't see the vertical deviation, you see the eyelashes move up and down. So she probably has an inferior oblique overaction. But with the both eyes open, she appears to fuse that small vertical deviation. So with her glasses, she's fine. So let's look at, we haven't finished yet because we have to do the near test. She's a little bit younger than the other child. So she's going to look at a target rather than a letter. And she's looking at one of the detailed accommodative targets. And you can see she's holding it herself. I've got her in the position and I want, so she's not fusing, not aligned for near. The moment I cover her, she's broken down into the same large angle esotropia that she had before. So she's fusing for distance, but not for near. So here, let's look up, close up. Now she's straight. Can you see? She's not got a deviation. 
She's looking straight and she's looking in the mid distance. Okay, so look at that small vertical deviation that you just saw. But when I remove the cover, she fuses that vertical deviation there. Now, so as for mid distance and distance, now she comes up near what you saw from a distance, you're going to see from here. When I get her to focus, look at that. When I say make the target clear, that's the magic of accommodation. So you must not do these tests to a spot of light. You have to make the light more interesting with a target on it or a blinking light, but better still use targets that are accommodated because you will unearth this kind of strabismus, which you will not if they were just to a light. So she does have a near isotropia which she can, she can keep everything blurred for near and keep her eyes straight. But when she has to read, she has an isotropia. So she has a controlled deviation for near distance, but a near isotropia. Is that okay? This is when the plus three diopter test comes in. So what you're doing with a plus three diopter is to neutralize or reduce her excessive accommodation for near, which is thought. And I must tell you thought because there is no proof apart from putting up a plus three. So the reaction to this optical manipulation in pediatric refraction is whether you can control it for near. And if you can, then people think you should give bifocals for that distance of one third of a meter, which, have got, which has got many issues with it. Uh, apart from the fact that bifocals are difficult to manufacture, keep at the right level, also, it only controls it for one third of a meter. Most children for near are looking at screens at 40 centimeters, looking at books down below. So they are not fully controlled. So plus three diopter is a good treatment for the clinician, but I think it's a very poor treatment for children. Uh, so here we go. So this is a plus three diopter lens. Let's see if you can control it with a plus three, which is the standard test that we all talk about. Plus three on the left, and to take the top left down. Okay, here we go. Getting her settled in, so she got enough time for accommodation to be neutralized, and see what happens. Oh, I'm sorry, this video is incomplete. Let me look at the next one. Okay, I'm really sorry, but I probably don't have the correct video here. I do have it, it's not coming up yet. Yeah. There. So you can see that the previous video, which was incomplete, showed a plus three diopter lens. And you just have to trust me that her squint was no different with a plus three than without a plus three for near fixation, near accommodative fixation. So I thought, okay, let's see how much we need to put up this through. How much excessive accommodation does she really have? So now we're doing a plus four and a half diopter. Uh, uh, lens and see whether we can control over this. So you can see that plus three was not the answer, but plus four and a half for near, that was for distance. This is for near. Let's see if we can control her. You'll have to look behind the lenses. So she's got a large vertical deviation, probably because of decentration. But she still has an isotropia. So that didn't help. So unfortunately, she is not going to be helped by plus three. Now we got a plus six. So you can see, and is she controlled with a plus six? That's for distance, not for near. She's holding it by herself. So it's very important that sometimes children hold it by themselves to get that proprioceptive feel. And now she's exotropic. Can you see she's exotropic? So nowhere between plus three to plus six, she was aligned. So she has very poor ability to hold her eyes. So it's important to realize that the standard test given in children, you have to go beyond that in pediatric refraction. Use your own logic to see if a plus three is not controlling it, does anything do? Does plus, is plus three controlling it? Does a plus two as well? And then you can decide whether you want to give bifocals or not. But that's a topic for another day. So I think I'm going to stop here because it is past my one hour. And I thank you for your patience. And hopefully this has given you a flavor of pediatric refraction.
And I am sorry, I'm not the kind of person who can cover all of pediatric interaction in one hour, but I tried to choose the best I could for you. But thank you very much for your patience and listening to me.